Uh, with all of that said, we are moving into uh, this series uh, called Walking Where Jesus Walked. We actually started it last week when I, I talked about um, Jesus beginning his ministry in the wilderness, in the, the Judean wilderness, but, but that it wasn't in the wilderness that he made a difference in our lives. It was beyond the wilderness. And I made the point that you and I have this wilderness in our life. We go through times of wilderness, but it's not in the wilderness that, we're cha- that we make a difference. It's in the wilderness where we're changed so that beyond the wilderness we can make a difference. Uh, and, and this week we're going to be looking at Jesus beginning his ministry around the Sea of Galilee. Uh, next week we'll step out of the series for a little while while I'm in prison, and Alex will be preaching on the unity of the body of Christ. It'll be your first opportunity to, to hear Alex and, uh, uh, and, and hear the gift God has given him to preach. Uh, so I hope you will come in and, uh, and enjoy that and learn from Alex uh, as well. Uh, and then after uh, that, we'll come back in. I'll look at the call of the disciples And then we will spend the entire month of Lent looking at the Beatitudes and and parts of the Sermon on the Mount. So uh, that's the weeks that are ahead of us. But today we're going down by the seashore. Uh, We call the the body of water the Sea of Galilee, but it's really a lake. And in fact, it's actually the world's lowest freshwater lake with a surface level of about 700 feet below sea level. Uh, It's about 13 miles long, 8 miles wide, and 141 miles deep. And it's around these shores that Jesus spent two-thirds of his ministry. Now, just an aside, uh, I have to give, go back to that other picture just a second. I have to give credit. My wife took this one, okay? Uh, This is her picture. Uh, She didn't sign it, but I told her I'd give her credit. The rest of the pictures are ones that I took while we were there. Um... It is an amazing and beautiful place. Uh, And and I don't blame Jesus for wanting to spend most of his time around the Sea of Galilee. You know, the name Sea goes back to when the Israelites first laid eyes on it after the Exodus, after they entered uh, the Promised Land, and they began to populate it, and they moved toward the north, and they came upon this huge body of water. Well, up to that point, the Israelites had not seen a large body of water uh, that wasn't a sea. You think about it. They left Egypt, and they came across the, the Red Sea, or as they called it in, in Hebrew, Yam Sup. Uh, and, and then they, they, they saw the Mediterranean Sea. They called that one uh, Yam Palestin, or the Sea of Palestine. Uh, we call it the Mediterranean Sea. The only other body of water they had seen beyond that was rivers. They had never seen a lake this size. They may have seen the Dead Sea, uh, but that is a saltwater body. It's rightly called a sea. But they didn't have another word, so they called this one Yom Kinneret, or the Sea of Kinneret, or Chinneret. It's gone through many names through the decades and and eons and centuries, Uh, But we know it as the Sea of Galilee from the time of Jesus and and to this day. So uh, Priscilla read for us the the scriptures and uh, uh, talking about Jesus beginning his ministry here at the home of Capernaum by the sea. He made his home there. Why don't we take just a moment to pray as we move forward in in our sermon. Holy God, may... The words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, Lord, as we study your word together. May it come alive in the stories that we tell and share. May every word that I speak bring glory and honor to you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I love the water. Uh, There's just something peaceful about the water. You know, some people are mountain people, and and they'll go to the mountains in the wintertime, and they'll go to the mountains in the summertime, and I love the mountains too, Uh, but but I gave away all my ski clothes because I'm tired of the cold. I I live in Texas for a reason. Um, If I'm going to go on a vacation in the summertime, 
Uh, usually I'm going to go to the beach. Now this summer I'm going to go with the Boy Scouts to Colorado. We're going to go backpacking up there uh, in the Greenhorn Mountains. Uh, but I'm taking my family to the beach for vacation. I love the water. There's just something peaceful about the sound of waves crashing on the beach or, or even the trickling sound of a mountain stream or, 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 or the, even the smell of the soil after the rain. I just love water and what water does for us. I love being <clears throat> around water so much that I spent most of my youth and young adult as a lifeguard. You know, the, whether it was hanging out at the lake shore, uh, being the lifeguard, you know, handing out the canoes and making sure the canoes all came back and, and the people that were in them, uh, and, or uh, uh, you know, sitting on the dock by the river at scout camp or, or on the lifeguard stand at church camp, uh, most summer days, you would find me soaking up sun somewhere. In fact, I'm hoping the pictures don't show up, but there are pictures of me out there with a flat top, bleached blonde, brown as a berry, and in much better shape than I am today. Maybe I do want those pictures to show up. But anyway, I digress. Uh, if you've ever been trained as a lifeguard, you know that you train hard, you get certified, and then you hope you never have to use it. Well, I was not that lucky. There were several times I had to use it. And I still remember one summer when I was lifeguarding at Camp Dirk Scout Ranch in Oklahoma. And uh, it was a weekend camp. At that time, we called it Dad and Lad. Uh, and that was back in the 80s. Today, we don't exclude moms, but back then we did. Uh, but our swimming area was a big bend in the Glover River. It was a deep area of the Glover River uh, that, that had very little current in it most of the time. But that particular summer, we had had a lot of rains. The, the river had swollen a little bit, and there was a lot of current. We even had to pull our docks in to protect them and, and then to, to shallow up our and, and shore up our swimming areas. Well, this particular dad and lad weekend, uh, there was a, a young scout and his dad came down for the swim test. And, and we were trying to encourage all of our scouts, whether it was, you know, they were the Weeblos or the Wolves or anything in between, we were trying to encourage them to just swim in the non-swimming area. Just get in, splash around, have fun. But this dad was having none of that. He said, my son's a swimmer, he's going in the deep end. And I tried to explain to him about the current and that it wasn't safe uh, that, and, and, and all, and that he needed to be a really strong swimmer. He said, well, he is a good swimmer. And I said, well, he's got to pass a swim test first. And usually we would give them the opportunity to take the beginner swim test, which is roughly 50 feet. You know, you just have to show you can swim. Or the, the real swim test, which was 100 yards uh, of swimming. And I didn't give this dad a choice. I said, well, he has to pass the beginner test before he can passed the swim test. After the dad yelled for a little while, telling the boy how, how good he was going to do and what he was going to do, instead of encouraging his son and listening to what his son wanted to do, the boy jumped in, made two strokes, and was sucked under the pier and didn't come out the other side. I still don't know how I did it. I dove off on the downstream side of the pier made a full circle against the current, grabbed the boy from under the pier, came up on the other side and drug him back up on the dock. I never saw the amount of love from a father then at that moment when he grabbed his son and hugged him, apologized to him, thanked me. He reached and grabbed me and pulled me into the hug. And then over the weekend, several times, he thanked me for saving his son's life. You know, I... I didn't want to use the skills that I'd learned, but I'm so glad I was there to save that kid. You know, I had other times where I had to save someone, but nearly every time it was uh, people not following directions. And I guess if anyone spends a lot of time around water, you find yourself in trouble at times. But, you know, we could spend weeks just looking at the times Jesus was on the water and brought peace. Or when Paul was in the storm on the Mediterranean Sea. Or when the Israelites were crossing the swelling waters of the Jordan River. Over and over we can see in Scripture times where people faced the life-giving and life-taking aspects of water. 
You know, sometimes I wonder if it was Jesus' love of the water and the beauty of his creation that, that, that caused him to want to make his home at Capernaum by the sea. I'm sure that was part of it, but another part was the fact that that region was safe. Now, I don't want to go into all the politics of, of the region of Israel during the time of the Roman Empire, uh, but that part of Galilee was considered safe. Uh, you know, Herod the Great, which the only thing great about him was he, he was a great builder, uh, he had died and he didn't want any one of his sons ruling his kingdom, so to speak. So he split it up between his four sons, and uh, each of them were ruling in a different way. And this northern part of Galilee, Jesus could go there, he was safe, he didn't have to worry about what was going on uh, in Jerusalem or Judea except when he went down to the temple. Jesus could enjoy teaching and sharing the reality of, of the kingdom of God with his followers without being constantly berated by the Jewish leaders uh, of Jerusalem or the Herodians. And, and as we reflect on the passage before us, there's a couple of things I want to define or kind of highlight. Uh, first is that you, you heard Priscilla read about the territories of Zebulun and Naphtali. Uh, if we go back into the Old Testament book of Joshua, we find that these two northernmost tribes of Israel were Zebulun and Naphtali. They were two of the, the sons who, who received their, their section of the kingdom, so to speak. But then, after the Babylonians came through and, and exiled most of the people from Israel, those two tribes were lost, never to be found again. Uh, they're, they're what some people call the lost tribes of Israel now. Uh, when uh, in the time of Isaiah, which Jesus quotes in verses 15 and six, or Matthew quotes here in verses 15 and 16, this region had become known as a, a region of Gentiles. You know, those God forsaken, godless, heathen Gentiles. And that's who lived around the Sea of Galilee. Uh, that's where the meaning of verse 16 comes in. It says, The people who sat in darkness have seen a great light, and for those who sat in the region and shadows of death, light has dawned. It, Jesus' presence with the people of Galilee was a, sh a light shining in a dark place. Uh, they were far from God, so God came near to them. And it reminds me of another verse. I hope you, you see the symbolism in that. And, and this other verse that, that John tells us in John 1.14. And the Word, Jesus, became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen His glory, the glory as, a fa as of a Father's only Son, full of grace and truth. You know, what Matthew was telling us was the same thing that John was telling us. In quoting that, and Matthew quoting from Isaiah 9, he was saying that God comes to us. God comes into the darkness of our world, comes into the most heathen places, the most godless places of our lives, and chases away the darkness. He, he comes to our seashore where life is great and calm, but he also meets us out on the waters in the storm and calms the raging sea of our life. God comes into our lives through the reality of the person of Jesus, and he changes us from the inside out. And that is good news. That is, that is great news for you and me. One last thing I want to touch on before we go grab a bite of chili and settle in to watch Matt McCrane kick off the XFL. Um, I know some of you are ready for that too. 3 o'clock on Fox. But before we get there, verse 17 tells us that it is from this place that Jesus began to proclaim the message of the kingdom of heaven and that it was near. This is where Jesus began his public ministry. The, the world would have said his ministry should start in Jerusalem or in Judea. But Jesus began his ministry right where he was, among the people of darkness, among the, the heathen of Galilee. So let me ask you, where have you started your ministry? 
Where, where have you started sharing that the kingdom of God has come near? I can say it another way. What have you done to fulfill the mission of the church? How, what have you done to help others to know, love, and serve God? How have you helped to make new disciples for Jesus Christ? Here's a couple of examples of what's going on right now in our church. One of our young college students came to us, and he started helping out with the youth, and he realized that some of the lights that we use in the Common Ground service and that the youth use, well, they weren't working right. So he started researching a little bit. He found out that we owned a software that we didn't even know we had. He's been working on the lights, getting the lights all working properly, doing funky things with them for the youth, and then keeping them nice and calm for the adults. But he's reprogramming all of it. If you've seen the video that uh, the youth put out for their new youth app to advertise their new youth app, he's the one that filmed it and edited it. He's using the gifts God has given him, his talents, to better the church, to reach out beyond these walls to reach new people. Here's another one. I'm intentionally not giving their names because I don't want to embarrass them. There's another young man. Last Thursday night we had a worship time before the youth prepared to go to winter camp. Uh, if you notice, the, there's no youth other than scouts around the building. Uh, they've either been at, uh, you know, we've got a couple of them that were at uh, uh, the uh, uh, stock shows or at uh, the, what is it, uh, solo and ensemble and different things like that, and they couldn't go to winter camp. But the rest of them are all gone. Uh, Thursday, we gathered together for worship, though. One of the young men said, I want to pray for the youth group. He's one of the youth. He stood up He prayed a beautiful prayer for the youth as we prepared to send them off to winter camp. A year ago, that young man wouldn't speak in front of a crowd. Thursday night, he was praying publicly for the youth if they can do it surely we can you know I, I really never wanted to use the lifeguarding techniques i learned but i'm so glad i did because there's a boy alive today because of it and even as a pastor and as a preacher I, there's a lot of times i don't want to venture out of my comfort zone uh, and talk to someone or or something like that, but I'm so glad I do. For instance, it made all the difference in the world for Matt. I ran into Matt when I was a pastor in Wortham, Texas, and uh, in, in Wortham, the parsonage was on one corner of the block, and the church was on the other corner of the block, and there was an empty field between the two. So, uh, he was walking by, and I was working in the yard one day, and for some reason, we started talking. And I visited with him for a while, and then I invited him to church. And, and Matt assured me he is not the church-going type. And, of course, I disagreed with him because I think everyone's a church-going type. And uh, a couple of weeks later, though, I looked up, and he's sitting on the back left in worship. So after worship, I was standing at the back, and I talked to him like I usually do. We visited for a while, and I found out that he, uh, he was working in the oil fields in the area, young man. You know, he was in his uh, early to mid-20s, and, and if you know Wortham, there's not a lot going on for your early to mid-20s in Wortham, Texas. Uh, but he seemed to be doing okay. Looked up the next week, he was back in worship, and then the next, and the next. Then one Sunday, I was greeting people as they left and shaking hands and he said hey can I come by and talk to you this week I said sure and we made a time when uh, he, he would know I was in the office and he swung by and we sat in my office and visited for a while and he told me that he could not be saved that he enjoyed coming to church he was loving what we were doing at the church he wanted to be a part of everything but he just couldn't be saved and I was a little confused, and honestly, I was a little scared uh, because I wasn't sure what he was about to tell me. Uh, but then he looked down at the floor of my office and said, I've got tattoos, and my grandmother told me that if I have a tattoo, 
I'm going to hell. I wasn't sure what to say at that point, so uh, I rolled up my sleeve and I showed him my tattoo. And then I said, uh, there is nothing that can separate us from God's love. And two weeks later, I baptized him. I didn't want to talk to a stranger in front of my yard who was walking by. You know, you get an image in your head. Yeah, I've got tattoos, but he had a sleeve of tattoos, you know, and you just get an image in your head. I didn't want to talk to a stranger, but I'm so glad I did. We all live in our own Galilee. We all live in the region of Gentiles. We all live among the people who have sat in darkness. They need to know that light has dawned. So who is God calling you to reach this week? Let's pray.